effects that we observe today here in the Lake District. It's a bit overcast, gone a bit chilly yesterday. I got sunburnt. Um, two different sets of weather scenarios. Climate is the average weather over a given time period. Typically in meteorology um, and climate studies, uh, the time period over which we take uh, or, or, or analyze uh, average weather patterns is, is 30 years. So typically we talk about um, uh, the climate, um, say between 1990 um, and um, 2020, for example, would be a typical window um, and then we can go back through windows uh, back through time and make observations on uh, changing climates. So climate change, therefore, is where we see changes in patterns of, of climate um, over time and it is nothing more than that. Um, so the question asked here is, is climate change new? And the image shows um, Avery Stone Circle. Now, like a lot of ancient monuments, Avery Stone Circle is, um, I believe, uh, one of these, but things like Stonehenge and Stone Circles, uh, even as far north as the Hebrides in, in Scotland, we believe are constructed five, 6,000 years ago um, and are aligned with, in particular, the winter solstice. So ancient monuments like this um, are, if you like, big computers. They've still got silicon at their heart. But the people who put these monuments up invested a lot of time and energy to do this on the basis that they would be able to anticipate seeing the rising sun in midwinter. If I was to instruct people to do that today, they would think I was absolutely bonkers. Um, because particularly in the Hebrides, you wouldn't expect to have a clear view to the horizon on um, midwinter. But it seemed to these people back then that this was worth the time and effort and is a strong indicator that climates have changed over time. Um, and what we experience in the British Isles today isn't necessarily what we've experienced in the past. So the big question that we need to therefore ask ourselves is how do we know about climate change? And this image um, uh, looking towards Mind Windermere as it, as it happens um, from Stony Cove Pike illustrates one way in which we know that climates have changed, let's say, at the British Isles. The image shows a staircase of former glaciated valleys ending at the bottom in Windermere itself. Um, and at some point in time, as it so happens, this was probably about 18,000 years ago, this valley was full of ice. It was glaciated. Britain was glaciated. Britain was a very, very different place. And in geological terms, in climatological terms even, 18,000 years ago is just a blink of an eye. So we can have really dramatic environmental changes driven by climate changes in the British Isles and the evidence is all around us sometimes in big landscapes and, and landforms such as this um, but otherwise in terms of proxy evidence uh, as it is known this is evidence that is not directly related to um, the climate but does indirectly link to to climate change so in the top left hand corner of this um, uh, screen, we can see a cross section through a uh, stalagmite and we can see that it's layered. Uh, we can see different bands of different colours and these are different um, layers of calcium carbonate that are deposited over time. The key thing about calcium carbonate, its chemical formula is CaCO3. The O3 relates to oxygen and oxygen comes in a number of different forms different isotopes uh, as it's known and some isotopes of oxygen are heavier than others when climates are cold um, not so much of the heavier oxygen evaporates from the oceans in the form of water so water molecules that contain heavier isotopes of oxygen are left behind in the ocean and consequently when it snows on ice sheets um, the, the, the snow is depleted in terms of um, heavy oxygen. Similarly, other forms of precipitation around the world uh, reflect this change between warm and cold climates by having this variation in 
um, the ratio of heavy isotopes of oxygen to light isotopes of oxygen. When we drill through um, a stalagmite, we can go back through time, look at the variations in um, heavy and light oxygen um, as transmitted via water into calcium carbonate, and that reflects changing temperatures over very long periods of time. The great thing about calcium carbonate is that it doesn't just occur in stalagmites, um, but it also occurs in corals. And as I hinted earlier, snowfall can reflect this change uh, in the form of ice on ice sheets. And if you core through ice back through time, again, we get a long term record of the changes in oxygen isotope ratios. This means that we can collect evidence from the high latitudes, the Arctic, from the mid latitudes, caves in the UK, and from the low latitudes, corals, and they all tell the same story of temperature change. And also by inference, we can tell something about humidity as well. So these are great proxy records of climate change going back over long periods of time. Another form of evidence is um, that of lake um, sediments. Um, the image shows uh, a, some preserved lake sediments um, in the Natural History Museum. Um, and what we see here are la layers of light sediment and layers of dark sediment. These are pairs of sediments. The light layers represent winter when lakes freeze over and very fine settled sediment can settle out. In the summer when the, uh, when the ice melts, then coarser material, often more organic material, can be washed into lake basins. So each pair, known as a varve, represents uh, a, a year. And so a huge um, column of sediment such as this can give us a year by year um, set of records of um, the sediments that are accumulating in lakes. Within those sediments, we can find things such as pollen, um, which tells us about vegetation uh, around the lake basin and therefore ultimately can tell us about climate and uh, temperature change, again, by proxy. Um, another way of looking at this is uh, illustrated in the bottom left, which is that's a sediment core, and you can see that it's very dark at the base, um, very peaty, but as we go up through the sediment core, there are changes and we get these becoming more light and becoming less organic. And again, this is reflecting environmental change in a local environment. And again, we can look at things such as pollen, um, beetles, a myriad of, of biological um, data that can tell us about changes in the environment by inference, uh, changes in temperature, precipitation and other factors. So we have proxy evidence that can tell us about climate change over very long periods of time and we can verify that indeed climate is not stable, climate does change, uh, sometimes dramatically as in when we have ice ages, but there are also more um, subtle changes. So even after the end of the last ice age, climate is not stable. It is broadly stable. We live in um, uh, a, a, a warm, moist environment in, in the UK, um, but the temperatures do change over time, the amount of moisture uh, changes over time, and so our humid uh, kind of environment does vary over time, and we should expect it to vary. Nothing's going to stay constant. And so when we look at some of the proxy data, um, and this graph is illustrating some proxy data at a number of different scales, we can see that climate changes over time. So this represents temperatures over the last uh, thousand years. Note the scale on the um, y-axis. Um, it's going from minus one at the bottom to plus 0.5 at the top. We've got a green curve and a red curve, which represents averaged northern hemisphere temperatures. The blue curve is more interesting. It uh, represents what is known as the Central England um, temperature data set um, and shows that even in the last thousand years, Central England has had on this scale um, significant temperature changes. We've been through what was known as the medieval warm period where it was a little bit warmer than it is today. Um, 
And we've also been through what's known as the Little Ice Age, where temperatures did pick up, drop by about a degree uh, on average during this time, during the, the most severe parts of this, this time period. Doesn't sound a lot, but actually changes of that scale are quite significant. So we've been through naturally fluctuating warm to cold, coming back to warm, and then towards the end of this curve, towards the present day, um, there's a really sharp increase in temperatures. And whilst it isn't statistically yet out with the range of normal for the last 10,000 years, it's certainly heading in a strange direction. We can look at that central England temperature change in a little bit more detail. What's interesting about this is that this isn't proxy data. This is real data. This is data that has been collected over the last um, three or more centuries, um, normally by people such as uh, Parsons, Vickers, um, people who've got a bit of spare time on their hand and as a hobby started to record rainfall, or certainly rain days, not in a standard way, but temperatures pretty much in a standard way um, over, the, over the whole time set. So the data here is presented, you can see a big scatter of dots, all taken from central England. And then there are averages. There's the 10 year moving average, that's the, the orange curve. And we can see fluctuations in temperature over the centuries, over the decades. Um, and then if we go to a 30 year moving average, and I mentioned at the beginning that we measure climate in terms of 30 year intervals, the data gets smoothed out the larger that you the larger period that you use. We can see that broadly speaking, there was it was a little bit colder at the beginning, relatively stable um, throughout most of the period, and then has warmed slightly um, during the first part of the 20th century, and again, significant warming uh, towards the end. This is real data, not proxy data, which you have to have a, a sort of a, a give and take in terms of what the true um, figure might be. This is the true figure. So the next question that we might need to ask is, is what is global warming? I ask this question because um, it is a term that is banded about in the media um, with not much critical analysis of what that actually means. As I think I've um, just illustrated, at times climates are warmer than we might expect, at times climate is colder than we might expect when we take a long-term perspective. When we talk about global warming today, we are talking about uh, a warming climate in which we strongly suspect human activity is the main driver of that warming uh, trend. So when we use the term global warming, we are normally referring to anthropogenic global warming, that is global warming caused by human activity. And the evidence for this is extremely strong. Um, this is a very recent um, chart that's been published by the uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And I find this a, a, a really fascinating graph to look at. There are three uh, curves, if you will, uh, presented here. Um, one represents uh, modelled temperature data uh, without um, data from human causes of uh, change. Um, that's the red one. The dark blue represents modelled temperatures um, with human causes of climate change uh, built into the model. And then there's the actual observed temperatures. So what this does is provide a very good test of what humans are doing and a very good test of our computer models that model climate change. So what our computers can tell us is that if we take out all the factors, the emissions that human beings cause that affect climate, uh, it's not just carbon dioxide, there are other gases as well. When we take that out, we get the red curve, which shows that climate over the last century and a half globally on average Yes, it fluctuates, but remains pretty stable over the long term. It would represent you know, a straight line, maybe slightly declining temperatures. Then the dark blue with the human emissions put in um, shows that yeah, climates have got warmer. So that's that's what our model says would happen. Now, a model is only as good as the data and stuff that you get in there. But we know that this model of climate, global climate, is very good 
because when we look at the real temperature, the observed temperatures, they're almost exactly the same as what our models predict. So we can have extremely high confidence that what our models are telling us, that human activity is affecting global temperature, is the real cause because our models are reproducing reality. So this is a very, very significant graph and people should be aware of this um, because it clearly demonstrates uh, there's no room for argument here. Human beings are affecting global temperatures and therefore global climates. So what is it that humans are doing? And I think we all know we, it's been in the media enough. It is consuming uh, fossil fuels, burning of fossil fuels, processing of fossil fuels um, that leads to the emission of carbon dioxide in particular, but also uh, other gases such as methane. Um, uh, chlorofluorocarbons in the past have also um, contributed uh, massively to pushing up global temperatures. And we've been doing it for a long time. Um, this image of the colliery buildings um, at Chatterley Whitfield and it represents a coal mine that's been shut a long time in the UK, but was operated back in the Victorian period. Um, we're all consuming globally fossil fuels and really pumping out massive amounts, in particular of carbon dioxide, but other critical gases as well. Methane is a much more uh, important greenhouse gas in terms of the amount of warming it can cause, but there's not a lot of it being produced, but it's still significant and, and we need to look at other gases, not just think about carbon dioxide. Why should we be concerned then about these raises, rises in temperature? I think the best thing is just to think about um, your own lives and your own impact. So these are some of my personal observations. Um, in the top left is an image of my house, which is quite relatively, or my old house, a relatively high altitude in the Staffordshire Moorlands, um, not irregularly getting flooded from the farmland next door because of um, bouts of heavy rain. Um, very luckily, this didn't go above my damp roof course, but this would happen to me several times a year. Um, a couple of decades ago, we might not have expected this. Flooding can impact all of us, um, and I think a lot of us have experienced flooding um, in ways that we perhaps don't remember it happening in the past. We can also have the obverse. We can have um, things drying out. So a couple of years ago, Staffordshire Moorlands um, around the Roaches, um, there was a drought. Um, the uh, organic soils, peats, uh, of the moorlands dried out and a fire was started and some really serious damage was done to the peats in, in, in the moorlands by by things burning burning through. Um, our, our uplands, our upland peats are extremely important as carbon sinks. We need to love, nurture and protect our moorlands if we are ever going to get towards um, net zero. Um, and we are doing a lot of things at the moment that are harmful to our upland moors um, and climate changes can only exacerbate that so we really need to nurture these things. Uh, the bottom right image um, I took after a storm um, back in 2013. The point of this is to see what damage the sea can do um, to uh, our built environment. There's a lot of infrastructure there that's been put in place to try and protect the land from the sea. Sea levels are rising, storms are going to more, most likely become more frequent, certainly more severe, um, and it costs millions and millions to put in infrastructure to try and protect our coasts. And we all end up paying for this, either through our taxes or through our insurance. Um, it's going to cost us, and these sorts of events are going to become more common, and we're going to invest, have to invest more and more to protect our houses from flooding, to protect from uh, drought, to protect from storms. So we should be concerned from that very selfish perspective um, without thinking of the, 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 the moral imperative to look after our planet. This image is from um, the Met Office and it's a nice image that gets us to think about the drivers of uh, climate change and then some of the um, consequences uh, in terms of the impact on the climate system of rising temperatures 
um, looking at all sorts of things from hydrology uh, on land through to um, uh, fisheries, uh, sorry, not, not fisheries, um, uh, water, ocean stability, ocean currents, um, the greening sometimes of, of the surface of the planet. You can see all these for yourselves. I don't need to talk through all this. And then some of the impacts and the impacts are, are, are many and varied. Um, water resources um, for human beings, impacts upon fisheries, impacts upon the range of um, infectious um, pests. Um, you know, the Anopheles mosquito spreading malaria used to exist in Britain and could quite easily come back um, because of, of climate change. We can also see, um, if we go to this website, I'm going to briefly take you to and hopefully be able to come back, um, what the impact might be in, in Staffordshire. So um, this is a nice little site. You can visit this uh, for yourselves. Um, I am going to put in my uh, postcode and this website will tell us if you put your own postcode um, what temperature changes we might expect given different scenarios of, of global warming uh, in terms of the summer. Um, this is possibly the most dramatic here, um, suggesting that if we have four degrees of global warming, then um, the hottest summer day in uh, North Staffordshire might be something like 39.3 degrees centigrade, which breaks the current record that we have um, for the whole of the UK. Two degrees centigrade is still 34. Don't know about you, but once it gets above 25 degrees centigrade, I get very uncomfortable. So we don't want to be encouraging that um, if we can avoid it. Similarly, maximum winter temperatures could rise significantly um, compared to uh, today. If we go yeah, down. We sorry, we can't actually see the website. I think it's just sharing the presentation. Oh, right. I'm really sorry. It's uh, OK. Um, if but we can send the link to the website afterwards for people to have a look at. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah, I would encourage people to go and do that. I'm really sorry about that. I'll come back to uh, my presentation. Uh, OK. So the question then becomes, you know, if global warming is happening and we can discover what the impacts might be uh, locally, what can be done? Now, obviously, there are things that can be done by governments, um, by big institutions, um, and th the agenda is clear that we need to move to a, certainly a more diverse uh, sources of, of energy, preferably more sustainable uh, forms of energy such as solar power, um, such as uh, wind power. We can also think about what we can do individually. So these next few slides um, is here to help you begin to understand your carbon footprint and what a carbon footprint is. So this slide demonstrates one example of what a ton of carbon dioxide looks like. It would fill up five, deca five double decker buses, um, so the cartoon suggests here. We then take this analogy and move forward with it. We can look at the average footprint of a UK uh, citizen. And when we look at what we do in our homes, we can see that given that five double decker buses is one tonne, we can see that you know we're producing the best part of two and a half tonnes through living at home, which is why we have um, campaigns such as Insulate Now. We need to do better with our homes to reduce our carbon footprints. But there's more to it than that. Look at our travelling. Compared to what we're doing in the homes, travel is a, a big cause of our individual carbon footprints on average for us as citizens of the UK. So travel is something that we need to think about. Food is also a big um, inputter of, if you will, uh, carbon dioxide or carbon dioxide equivalents. Um, I'm sorry, I think the slides are lag lagging a bit. Are you on the slide? We're on slide 14, but we can't see any buses. <laughs> oh, rats. Um, <laughs> right. Uh, Is it not synced up or? 
sync to uh, let me, uh, sync. Can, yeah. right okay um i'll go back and go forward can you see my boss no i'm just no. I'm just synced, i'm just synced to slide 14 um hang on i'll take control oh yeah we're on the buses now Right, OK. okay. <laughs> yeah, it's changed. we're on 60, slide 16 now, yeah. 17 I'm now. 17, OK. 17, right. yeah, got it. I'll go uh, back right. to the buses. Sorry about that. So there's our, uh, what we, the amount of carbon dioxide produced in the home. There's what we do in travel, uh, what we do in food, and things that we purchase, and also um, in terms of some of our public services uh, that we consume. The big areas then of um, our carbon footprint are really around the home, travel and food, but there are other things that we can that we can do. Um, and there's some notes there as well. There we go. Um, so this is what we do individually as a UK citizen. Um, there are certain parts of the political spectrum that suggest that because the UK's global emissions are only contributing about 1% of global CO2, that we don't need to do much. This isn't, in my view, uh, a realistic perspective. We are all citizens of this planet, and if we all make an effort to try and reduce our carbon footprint, we will achieve globally, as global citizens, um, the necessary changes that we need. So, for example, when we um, compare the average footprint of a UK citizen, as in, indicated by the grey bosses, with that of the of an average Chinese citizen, yes, China produces one hell of a lot of carbon dioxide, but the individual Chinese citizen, on average, is contributing far less CO2 to the global CO2 production than we are. And it's harder for the average Chinese citizen to really cut down there are things that average chinese citizens can do but it's hard for them to cut down compared to us as uk citizens another big producer of carbon dioxide is uh, india and the average indian citizen is producing far less carbon dioxide than us so i don't take the argument that there that we don't need to do anything in this country i think we need to help other countries cut their carbon emissions and we need to help ourselves as individual citizens um, by cutting uh, our own personal uh, carbon emissions, which therefore begs the question, what can you do and what is your carbon uh, footprint? And in terms of what you can do as a citizen, there are a number of obvious things, as indicated by that first uh, double decker bus diagram. First thing we can do is perhaps think about food and what we consume um, and how we consume it and the way in which yeah the way in which we do all of that um, now i'm not here to proselytize i'm not here to preach um I, it's just pointing out some facts for the audience's information i am not vegetarian i'm not vegan i am an omnivore but there is a message out there we are consuming too much meat um, as a society. Um, globally, there is a big problem with uh, cattle consumption and sheep consumption, and we need to think about what we are doing. In the UK and in New Zealand, um, the problem isn't as bad as it is in the rest of the world. We happen to be in the right kind of environment that means that the amount of carbon dioxide associated with grazing cattle and sheep is not as bad as it is elsewhere, but it is still significantly higher than, for example, producing uh, cereals or vegetables. So perhaps we can think about alternative forms of meat. Um, perhaps we can just decide to have a vegetarian meal once a week, something like that. Um, but that will help to reduce our individual impact upon um, uh, the global climate. Um, <sighs> recent studies have shown that um, actually uh, grazing in, in Western Britain um, and maintaining the soils for that kind of farming um, actually helps 
reduce carbon dioxide. The soils there are are carbon sinks, um, and are a bit and are more effective than uh, mature woodland at, at removing uh, carbon dioxide. So, it's not all a bad story. We don't have to give up everything that we've done, but perhaps making some changes would help. Uh, personally, I have been just using local uh, rapeseed oil, which is why I've got the picture in the middle. Um, and I've been doing it for years. I've given up importing olive oil, sunflower oil, going local, using local produce. Again, can only be uh, a good way forward. If you're into vegetarianism, veganism, then, you know, making the right choices is important. Um, even so, so in eastern England, uh, we've got a problem. The soils are being exhausted. There's perhaps 75 harvests left. The only way we maintain farming systems at the moment is through fertilizers and chemicals and herbicides and all that sort of thing, which um, are net producers of CO2, consume fossil fuels. I think the message here is that for whatever we do with regard to food, try and shop locally, try and reduce your carbon footprint, and perhaps if you can, go organic. Um, because this is going to be the best way of helping to reduce our carbon footprints. Whatever you can do, whatever little change you can make will help. Um, and it doesn't really matter what change it is, as long as we do try and think about what we're consuming, where we get it from, how it's produced. Oops, a little bit far. Um, transport is another way that we can massively impact, as we saw from the earlier di diagrams. Um, do we have to take the car to the shops? Is it perhaps not better to walk if we have the opportunity to do so? Maybe just one journey a week where we walk to the shops rather than uh, take our cars. Um, thinking about alternative uh, forms of public transport, going by bicycle, going by train, is a lot better than going by car. Have I got a car? Yes, I have. And do I make journeys in my car by myself? Yes, I do. Um, I'm not <laughs> a saint by any means, but I do try and think, do I need to make this journey? Can I go by public transport if I can? If we look at the image of all those vehicles uh, uh, in Stoke on Trent, the vast majority uh, have got one person in the car. Is there any way that we can change what we do in terms of transport just to reduce uh, our impact? Can we afford to, to go electric? Probably most of us can't at the moment, but hopefully in the future we might all have that reasonable economic choice to go electric and change the way we transport ourselves and we also perhaps need to think about consumption you know we live in a rich consumption-led society do we need to be changing our fridges our hi-fis our well, i'm going to show my age now um our consumable products uh, as often as we do. Look at the mountain of metal that you can see in the, in the recycling station. Um, we get through a hell of a lot of goods, um, white goods, um, it, it, as a society. And a lot of it is probably unnecessary in terms of it's just changing fashions. Oh, we'll have a new kitchen. So we throw out a hell of a lot of stuff. It's all about changing the way we behave and, and the way we think. So there are some things we might think about. Here are some others. Um, these are recommended um, uh, by Staffordshire County Council. So encouraging us to recycle at home, visiting recycling centres with, with waste um, so that it doesn't just go to landfill. Thinking about using plastic bags three times minimum. I have got mountains of plastic bags that I collected over the years because I'm determined not to throw them out and I'm just waiting for them all to fall or fall to bits before I will then drop them off with supermarkets and get them recycled. Um, if we want to change things, can we think about giving stuff to charity, see whether things can be upcycled, recycled rather than just thrown away? Uh, one tip is to write a shopping list so that you don't overbuy food. Um, certainly the amount of food that we waste is about a third of our household um, production of uh, carbon dioxide. So it is important to think about, you know, buying the right amount of preferably fresh, locally grown organic food and not throwing it away. Uh, another tip that I've added on here, turn your thermostat down to 19 degrees centigrade. Just turning it down one or two degrees um, can have a really significant impact upon your carbon footprints. 
Another thing you can do is actually explore your own carbon footprint. Now, I've not provided links here. These are images of apps that you can put on your smartphone. Um, these are four different kinds of uh, apps. There are others. Um, and you can download these apps and work out what your carbon footprint is. And so this is my results. Um, some of these results make me feel a little bit smug because um, I am slightly lower than the average, but I do have some way to go. The different apps calculate things in different ways, as you can see, as to which one is more accurate. I couldn't offer an opinion, um, but some of them, the one on the right um, shows you uh, your monthly consumption, um, and a lot of them will track if you put in data once a month or so. It will help you track your, your carbon emissions and perhaps help you work out how you can reduce your own carbon footprint over time. So it may be something that you're interested in, in looking at and, and having a go at. As I say, those are four that I looked at um, a, a few months ago. Have a look, see, see if you can find um, your own um, pr preferred kind of carbon footprint calculator. Other things that you could do, well, I won't follow the links because obviously that hasn't worked. Um, but again, we could put some of these links in for you to explore. It's interesting to look at um, uh, climate change jobs, the number of jobs that are becoming available related to climate and environmental change. There are thousands of them, <laughs> some of them extremely well paid. So if you're thinking of um, if you're young and entering into a career or think of changing a career, do have a look and see what's there and whether you could contribute to um, making positive um, climate change uh, impact. Um, uh, Get Composting is supported by Staffordshire County Council. Um, that's a, a, a website that, where you can order subsidised um, compost bins, um, uh, and other and water bots and, and, and other paraphernalia around the home that can help you recycle and perhaps reduce your carbon footprint. You could join the Make Staffordshire Sustainable Facebook group um, and also sign up for Staffordshire County Council alerts where once a week perhaps you get an email that might contain suggestions to help you cut your carbon footprint. And if you are uh, thinking of going to university and you're a student that's doing no matter what, you could apply to study with us at Staffordshire University on geography, climate change and society and help you get help you get a, a relevant degree that might help you get into that jobs market uh, that I was alluding to uh, earlier. OK, that's the end of my talk. Uh, thank you for your patience and for listening to me and putting up with some of the errors as I presented. Um, I'll stop presenting now and if anyone's got any questions, I'll be happy to ask them. couple of hands up so I'll just um uh Lisa do you want to go first can't I can't hear anything if you're are you muted speaking. I'm muted <laughs> muted <laughs> right I'm concerned about electric vehicles because obviously electricity has to be generated from somewhere and I understand that the lithium batteries that are put into electric cars, the mining of it is not particularly very nice. And I'm also concerned about the disposal of those batteries once they've run their lifestyle. What's the advice yeah. on that? Right, I, I wouldn't know what the advice is. Um, I, I've had a number of discussions with um, friends of mine, one of whom lives in Germany and he's an engineer. And the issue of electric vehicles is complicated at the moment because of the way we produce electricity in this country the overall impact of having an electric car is probably neutral um, because of the way we produce electricity and the life cycle of the production of the car and as you say the disposal of materials um, and so the best that you can say about electric vehicles at the moment is you're not going to do any harm by having an electric vehicle. And it, as we transform to a more sustainable national energy production, then it will become better in terms of carbon dioxide equivalent emissions that we drive electric rather than driving fossil fuel powered. But I think the your concerns 
of the whole life cycle of such cars and the way we produce electricity at the moment is are, are valid. I know that Thank isn't you. a yes or no, but no, it's and uh, yeah, it's it's still not there, is it? It's not quite no. there yet. Um, no. You know, we we do need to produce electricity more efficiently. My husband was a turbine generator specialist engineer, working mainly at nuclear power stations. So, I've got a little bit of knowledge. Yeah, yeah. My father worked in uh, electricity. Yeah, as well. yeah. But it's interesting. Both the UK and Germany, it's pretty much neutral. But there are other parts of Europe where um, they do produce electricity in a better way than we do, and. Therefore, having an electric vehicle is probably a better thing in certain other parts of Europe. OK, thank you, Pat. Um, David, do you would like to go next? Hi, yes, hi. I'm, 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 a, I'm a planning officer at uh, Staffordshire Moorlands Council. I, th I think yeah. it was stated, hi, it was stated in, the, in the presentation a few minutes ago that ab about soil pastures can act as a carbon sink and yeah. the comparison with woodlands um yeah because um we're, we're currently co conceptualizing work about how to expand habitats and for by reasons of biodiversity gain and and for other purposes so i, I was not aware about the, the uh, soil pastures acting as a carbon sink could, could you just talk right. about that yeah right. um they, they they act as a carbon sink um through the whole life cycle of the growing season and then the grazing of animals and that sort of thing if particularly where the farming is organic, preferable to using um, uh, uh, chemicals such as fertilisers, um, so that are, that that subsidises the, the, the vegetation system. Um, the comment about the woodlands is it's only in comparison to mature woodlands. So mature woodlands, if the trees are fully grown and there's not enough room for new saplings to come through, then they're they're carbon neutral. Growing woodlands does they are um, that that will act as a carbon sink and takes carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere as as the woodlands grow once right. they become mature 70 to 100 years then the, the the climate impact will then cease unless we manage the woodlands as we probably should do pollarding coppicing and encouraging new growth um constantly so yeah it was just a comparison with mature managed woodland all right th thanks very much yeah. Thank you. Um, Alan, would you like to go next? Uh, can you hear me then? Yes, yes I can hear you. Right. Um, well, I, my background is a very long time ago, I, I was a chemistry teacher and mm. I, I've been fascinated by this topic for many, many years. Um, but as with so often when you have a lecture of this kind, and it was a really good talk uh, with some lovely stuff, and I learned some stuff about the geology. But mm. Nobody, uh, and you um, particularly, <laughs> well, we all forgot who I know, anyway, um, explains what greenhouse gases are. How, right. how does the earth get warm because of these rather simple chemicals, especially in such tiny amounts? And I, I did a talk recently to my um, uh, uh, sort of political group that, we, that uh, I, I, I meet with and explained it this way. I said, really, the earth, is like uh, a microwave oven mm. and essentially radiation comes in it's visible ultraviolet infrared and it gets absorbed by the earth and, and obviously the, the earth gets warmer but then because hot bodies radiate heat out they go out again these these the, the heat goes out as infrared radiation mm. and unfortunately the things that we sometimes just call carbon, which actually means CO2, carbon dioxide, CH4, methane, H2O actually as well, are all in fact special molecules which are called dipoles. That is that when infrared interacts with them, just as a microwave oven interacts with the water in the food to cook our food, they get hot. And so, you know, it, it amazes me that nobody ever explains this to people, <laughs> you know, to actually, you know, to say, well, this is the problem that you're facing. And in fact, you know, it's quite astonishing that when I started teaching over 60, 70 years ago, um, there was only 0.03% of 
of, of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere then, it's still only risen to 0 0.04, but it has this incredible effect of causing this, this temperature rise. And it is basically because the CO2 molecules, they vibrate, they absorb this infrared energy and they warm the air and they warm the water. And when it comes down, it's warmer. And that is why the earth is steadily increasing in temperature. So I just wonder how many people agree that's a good explanation of, of, of why this happens. Yes, I think that that's, that's a, a very good, precise and um, simplified without you know without denegrating it at, at all a uh, way of explaining what um the impact of greenhouse gases are and of course it's also not often explained that um without greenhouse gases the earth would be about 15 16 degrees centigrade cooler we need these greenhouse gases for life for life to exist um this is the whole point about climate fluctuation being natural it's just the unnatural fluctuation. But you're quite right to point out, you know, the role that carbon dioxide and methane and, and other gases play in terms of uh, absorbing that um, outgoing um, infrared radiation um, and, and re-emitting it to warm the planet's atmosphere. Um, and we need the carbon dioxide to do that, but we just don't need too much. That's the, that's the message. Thank you. Um, Joe, would you like to go next? Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for the excellent presentation. Um, Councillor Joe Porter, Cabinet Member for Climate Change and Biodiversity at Staffordshire Moorlands District Council. Um, I was really pleased that um, in your presentation you mentioned Upland, Peatlands, because um, in the Staffordshire Moorlands we are working with Staffordshire Wildlife Trust and the Pitt National Park Authority on a project called the Wilder River Chinook Project. And we're also working with them on peatland restoration. And um, obviously what we're trying to do is we're trying to restore habitats as part of nature-based solutions to climate change. And obviously I'd be interested to hear your thoughts of any ideas and advice you might have for us in terms of working with the private sector on trying to get businesses involved in um, peatland restoration, because it's all well and good, obviously, us putting in public funding but I think you've also got to get that private sector funding if we're to make this a success because obviously we're, try we're all trying to cut carbon emissions and you know I think the priority obviously has got to be driving down those emissions but we are going to have to do some offsetting as part of that and obviously we've got to treat the climate and biodiversity crises as interlinked. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah I mean it's difficult for me to speak with any authority on on such thing but it is about um the ecology of the moorlands it is about the ecology of peat it is a fantastic sink of carbon dioxide because it's literally just um rotting material that is just locking carbon in 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 the form of carbon away in um in the peat and the and and the, and the other acidic and, and waterlogged soils they're they're just great for getting rid of um, carbon dioxide. And if we don't maintain those environments, then those in the private sector that perhaps rely upon these landscapes um, to generate income, if that, if those landscapes disappear because we haven't looked after the peat and the soils, then it will be to their detriment. It is worth their while to try and um, rehumidify the uplands. You know, instead of draining the moors, we need to retain the water in the moors, we need to, um, yeah, make it more soggy again so that the peat can grow um, over time and absorb the carbon dioxide. The very, very, I mean, in terms of biodiversity, global biodiversity, uh, our moorlands are absolutely valuable on a global scale. Uh, we contain, our country contains so much of this kind of environment, um, uh, of the global sort of percentage of this environment. They're very special environments, they're very beautiful. And if private landowners want to continue to generate income through the presence of these moors, then it's in their own interest to look after the health of the moors. And that's the best advice I think I can give. I totally agree, because peatlands are quite literally the UK's rainforests. And just to very mm. quickly add, if any of your students at Staff Uni want to get involved with any of our climate change projects in the Staffordshire Moorlands, then they'd be most welcome to get involved. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much for your offer. 
Thank you. Um, and we've got Mark with his hand up. Hi, um, Mark Johnson from Moreland's Climate Action. Actually, my, my question follows on nicely from Joe, from what Joe said, because as he as he points out, um, Staffordshire Moreland's District Council has been very active in, in its biodiversity efforts. Um, I'm, I'm I'm interested in the science and re in, in the relationship between um, habitat enhancement, which is obviously a good in itself, but mm. that and the temperature gradient, climate itself, um, it's it's because it's often treated as rather static. It seems to me, and it's dynamic. If if the temperature keeps going up, the you know the equation changes, and it seems to me we've got very limited science on that at the moment. I, I try to follow the evidence with the wildlife trusts, etc. Um, I, I'm just interested in on your take on what where the science stands on that. Yeah, um, so I mean that example that I quoted, it was just quite by accident that I came across this paper that was talking about soil uh, carbon sequestration in um, grazed soils um, in the UK, and you know it has to be very specific. And there is a lot of new research that it it is coming out all the time in a, in a wide variety of journals. I mean, some of them are coming out in really sort of business orientated. Uh, journals that are talking about ecology and ecological impacts um, and trying to measure ecological impacts. And if I'm finding material in a wide range of uh, places, but I think the question that you asked and the point that you made is accepted by many people who come from a diverse set of backgrounds, but who are interested in trying to work out, you know, OK, so the climate's warming. What What is happening to our ecology? What is happening agriculturally? What are going to be the consequences? What changes do we need to make? So, yeah, I think it, it's a, a very important and emerging area of scientific study. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Um, has anyone else got a question? I think that's all the hands up um so far um oh, didn't realize um, i didn't put my camera on that's okay <laughs> I didn't mean to do that um i can't see any more questions um oh alan hand up again you're on mute you're muted alan There we go. Sorry, they're a bit slow. Incidentally, can you explain on this system how you get rid of this irritating bar with the timeline, the mute, and all these and, and all this lot? How do you get rid of that? <laughs> it, it spoiled most of the photographs, I'm afraid. It's a great shame. I, I, you know, it, it doesn't work like Zoom. I can get rid of it then. Anybody know how you get rid of it? Or does anybody else have this problem? Um. It shouldn't overlay the presentation. Um, it should sit at the top. I'm not sure why it would be covering the pictures. Anyway, can't find how to do it. This is a shame. I mean, one of one of the things that is is, is quite unfortunately true is that uh, the coal industry that some people still actually feel is you know is a solution to all our problems is of course the total cause of our problems. And, you know, I, I'm very proud of Staffordshire and um, I, I appreciate just how much uh, the engineers that uh, transformed uh, steam engines and atmospheric engines, stuff like that, enable us to mine coal. But unfortunately, it was the biggest disaster for mankind that you can imagine. Because unfortunately, having burned most of our forests down to make charcoal to make our iron and steel, we then discovered the wonders of coal. And then we discovered the wonders of making atmospheric engines and then steam engines, which enabled us to deal with the problem of water in the mines. Mm. And from that moment on, our disaster was secured. Unfortunately, at the time, we thought this was God's goodness to us, giving us this wonderful fuel underneath the earth. In fact, for most of the four and a half billion years this planet has been around, nature has been actually trying to lock that carbon inside the earth safe and sound and of course we've for the last two or three hundred years have been digging the stuff out and now we're digging out gigatons of it and of course the 
history, nations like India and China say, well, it's our turn now. I don't know where they think they're going to go with it, but unfortunately, this gift from God is an absolute disaster, I'm afraid. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I just thought we could leave that as a, as a conclusion. Leave that as a conclusion. <laughs> well, you know, as I say, the Earth became inhabitable because the carbon dioxide was removed from the atmosphere and safely stuck under the ground, most notably in the Carboniferous period. And of course, King Cole, which I sort of grew up with, was the greatest industrial force we had, and we dug it out, and we were the major suppliers of the world. Yeah. And unfortunately, we have a lot to, to be blamed for, I'm afraid, in spite of the incredible uh, cleverness of our engineers. It's awfully sad, but unfortunately, you can't really put the clocks back, can you? No, can't change the past. All we can do is try and create a better future. I think that has to be our goal. There ain't no way of putting it back. Mm. The sequestering carbon in power stations and stuff like that still seems to be so expensive that nobody's even hardly trying it apart from a few pilot plants. This mm -hmm. set up in Iceland, which is supposedly, you know, a, a way of, of removing carbon from the atmosphere, CO2 from the atmosphere, that all froze up apparently recently. But that's hardly a viable technique either. <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> Anyway, I'm going to go for lunch now. <laughs> right. Thank Be careful you. what you're Nice to talk to you. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Um, I don't think there's any more questions. I think, uh, unless Mark's hand up, I think that was from before. Um, and I'm conscious of time, so I think we'll um, wrap it up if, in, if you're okay with that, Tim. I'm fine, thank you. Thank you for listening. Lovely. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you. Thanks, bye. Right. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you.